Um, so, I have a slightly different story to tell. Yes. Two weekends ago, we were in Southern California watching our daughter Mary graduate from Pitzer College. It was those most marvelous, magical experience. As she strode across the stage and got her diploma, she was beaming, as you can see, with pride and joy and the belief that she could do anything in the world that she wanted to. So after the ceremony, we went to the side lawn, Michael, my husband, and our daughter, and friends, and we watched Mary and her friends popping champagne bottles and taking photos and talking about what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. And we looked at them and thought, how confident these young women are. How did they get this way? And we said, well, of course they've got great parents, right? <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that, they had access to a great education. They had wonderful mentors. But even before that, they had access to fundamental resources that had to be in place to even get them there. Basic things like food, like health, like safety that we never think about. And one thing that I think about every morning, noon, and night, clean water. And here in California, we are all thinking about water, right? <laughs> it's all about where is the water, how much water can we save? And it is just turning into the most amazing conversation. So for the next 10 minutes or so, because I'm going to be longer than Sally, <laughs> um, I want you to put in your brain and nestle in your hearts two ideas that I hope you take away from this amazing evening and make them yours, use them, <coughs> act on them wherever, whenever, however you can. The first one is that water is in and involved with everything we do in our lives. And it is so important that each one of us take a vow to make sure we pass it on to the next generation. And number two, my subversive idea, is that clean water in the hands of women and girls is the single most important resource we have to make our collective world the world we want it to be. So, let me get on by talking about dinosaurs. <laughs> and I promise it's on point. So, the Earth, as most of you have learned somewhere along the way, has 70% of its surface made up of water. And you may know that 60% of our bodies, at least, are water. But did you know that 2.5% and only 2.5% of all the water in the world is fresh water? And only 1% of water is water that's accessible. Although with icebergs melting, that topic may be changing soon. So with that 1%, we have the same amount of water available to us as our friends the dinosaurs did how many years ago? Pretty amazing. Now I'm going to fast forward you several billion years to maybe around your sixth grade science fair. Everybody have one of those? And everybody had to make posters. And maybe your poster was like my poster. My poster was not as pretty as this poster. But it was all about how rain falls from the sky, goes to Earth, nurtures the plants, goes out to the oceans, and eventually evaporates up into the sky again. It's the most ultimate recycle program in the world. And it's four billion years old. Next to oxygen, water is the single most important thing we all need to survive. It's basic. You can live seven days without food, but you can only survive three to four days without water. And then on the entire other end of the spectrum, diarrhea, our favorite topic, which is all <laughs> about the lack of clean water and sanitation, kills children at the equivalent rate of one jumbo jet crashing every 10 hours. And last year, over 840,000 people died around the world of waterborne diseases. That's more than the entire city of San Francisco. So what is happening? Our most precious resource water is being taken for granted. In the United States, every day, all of us use on average 57 gallons of water just to do the basics. To drink, to clean, to wash, to flush the toilets with clean water. But 
we don't even take into consideration the 850 gallons it took to put that steak on that plate behind me, or the nearly 100 gallons it took to put the rice next to it. It is unbelievable how much water we are using. When you look halfway around the world, in India, the average person only uses 14 gallons of water for everything they do that uses water. So what is the difference? You know, we are finding it so difficult to reduce our water usage. What if we had to reduce it to the Indian level? That would mean we'd have to reduce it by 75%, and that is pretty crazy. So my journey to water and to Blue Planet Network is far from planned. So good luck to all of you in your journeys. I started out as a consumer marketer. I spent 25 years with American Express to Visa, Charles Schwab to E-Trade, Yahoo to consulting for lots of startups in the Valley. A similar story to probably many people in this room. But what I really loved was understanding the customer. Who were you? And what were your needs? And what were your expectations? And how could I figure out how to deliver services that met and exceeded those expectations? That's what got me excited. So one morning, I was in probably August of 2005, just about 10 years ago. I was walking down the street to the office of Prosper, which was a new startup, very exciting startup, that I had just joined as the head of marketing. I crossed the street, and my life changed forever. There was an underground transformer, and that underground transformer converted the electricity from the local utility company to the buildings around it. That transformer malfunctioned and exploded. Fire flames shot up 30 feet in the sky, and everyone immediately thought that there had been a terrorist attack. Fortunately, only one person was injured in that attack. Unfortunately, that person was me. I suffered second and third degree burns over 40% of my body, and my right elbow was totally shattered by the force of the manhole cover flashing through the air. I can tell you, I never walk over manhole covers anymore. <laughs> I was taken, thank goodness, to nearby St. Francis Hospital, where I was put in an induced coma for two weeks. Then I was in the hospital for two months for multiple surgeries and multiple grafts. And then I was in physical therapy for two years to learn how to walk again and get full use of my hands. Needless to say, I had lots of time to think during my recovery. And I knew that when I was recovered and ready to go back to work, I was going to take that 25 years worth of skills and experience, and I was going to use it to do something blankety-blank fantastic to help the world, and I was going to make sure that it was measurable, because that was what was important to me. So when someone told me I should go visit a gentleman by the name of Jin Zidell, who was 72 years old and a Zen Buddhist, and had sailed around the world, and who happened to be interested in water, and was looking for a CEO for a little startup nonprofit called Blue Planet Network. I went because it was sort of interesting, not because I was terribly passionate about what he was talking about. As I said to Jin, Jin, I understand water is important, but my passions are all about the environment and the empowerment of women and girls. And he sat back. Probably his Zen Buddhism held him in good favor at that moment. And he said, Lisa, I'm glad you get the connection between health and clean water. What if I were to tell you that 200 million hours every day are wasted by women and girls around the world lugging water? What if I were to say that we could end that task for them? What if I were to say we could give that time back to them? What do you think they would do with that time? Do you think that would be empowering women and girls? I knew right then I was sunk. And I knew also that I had found the job and the mission that would take all of my passions and all of my intellect and all of my experience and put it together. So that began the next seven years of my life. Blue Planet Network is an amazing global member community of over 110 water and sanitation organizations operating in 27 countries, including right here in the United States, in the state of California, because we have the same problems everyone does around the world. 
Our members use our online platform and services to improve the planning, implementation, and long-term monitoring of their projects, as well as to share their learning with everyone so everyone can succeed. And six, since 2006, our members have worked with us to help over two million people, two million people, gain and keep access to sustainable safe drinking water and sanitation. But the power is not in the numbers because there are still 745 million people to go. So we have got a long, long way. The real power is in the stories behind those numbers, is in the stories of the people, especially the women and the girls, whose lives have been transformed by safe drinking water. My team and I always say we are not deliverers of member services or customer support. We help to unleash health, hope, and happiness. That's my job. And that's a pretty tall order, but we measure it every day with data and with stories of people like Agnes. And Agnes is an amazing woman to be. Agnes lives in the Samburu region of northern Kenya, one of the driest places on earth. Women there typically walk three to six miles a day to get water, which oftentimes is dirty. They carry jerry cans, and you can see on Agnes's head there are two jerry cans. And then there's one over there in the corner, not to distract anyone. But when those are filled, they weigh 40 pounds. Look at how young she is. Look what she's doing. But that's what Agnes and the women in that community did for endless hours a day. So because Agnes was spending all her time gathering safe water, she didn't have time to go to school. And it probably didn't matter anyhow because she probably wouldn't have made it past puberty because her school didn't have a private toilet. So she would have had to drop out a week every month. And that probably would have led her to drop out altogether. And if you look at the school board, it tells the story. In preschool, for those in the back of the room who can't really see it, there were already twice as many boys as girls enrolled, 66 boys and 34 girls. Over the years, everyone was pressured, boys and girls, to drop out and help their families. But at the end of standard seven year, there was only one girl left, left in that original class, one. So I can quote academic studies that talk about how access to clean water helps girls go to school. There was one in particular that water.org cited, which I found really important. It was in Ghana. And it said that even if you reduce the collection time of water by 15 minutes, that's about the time we get a latte today, that increased girls' percentage of total enrollment in schools by 8 to 12% talk about empowerment. But then I've got an even more powerful story to back up that powerful piece of data. This is Josephine. Josephine is an equally amazing young woman. She was one of those young girls who couldn't go to school because she was lugging water all day long. But after Blue Planet Network member the Samburu Project worked with the community to implement a deep borehole to get the water and teach the community about hygiene and sanitation, she was the first one back to school. And she is now studying to be a nurse practitioner because she wants to help the women and girls in her community get and stay healthy. As Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina says, the thing that terrorists are most terrified of is an educated girl. So guys, watch out. <laughs> but the magic of clean water that I call the humankind wonder drug, goes on from there. Now, meet Gloria. Gloria and the women in the community, they went out and used the stable source of water to build a kitchen garden. The Samburu people are traditionally nomadic, wandering all over because they can never find a stable source of clean water to stay with. But now that they have one, Gloria and her friends are growing vegetables for their family and selling the extra at market so they can make money. I think they put it in their pockets to send their girls to school. But that is an amazing accomplishment. And then there are mothers like Anna, proud Anna, with their kids and seeing how they're getting stronger and healthier with clean water. Look at that gorgeous baby. That baby has a future. And after Blue Planet, or after the Samburu Project finished 
the well with the community. They sat down and talked to them about building something called a water user committee, which is essentially pure democracy. The community manages the well and collects all the finances. And some of the Samburu women volunteered to be part of that committee. And this was their first taste of leadership, and they liked it. They liked it a lot. And so from now on in, their husbands, instead of saying, you know, that's my wife, because they were now helping to manage the community's most important asset, those husbands are now starting to say, I'm her husband. <laughs> and that, if that is not empowerment, just like all the other stories, I don't know what is. So I owe Jin Zidell a debt of eternal gratitude, because he was right, and I was pig-headed. But I believed him, and look what's happened. But this power of clean water as humankind's wonder drug goes on and on all around the world, not just in the Samburu region. Meet Mabel up in the upper left-hand corner. She lives in Nicaragua. Blue Planet Network member El Porvenir is helping her get water to go to school. Then meet Mira and her daughter over here. They live in West Bengal, India. They're helped by Blue Planet Network member Project Well. Then meet Iris in Uganda drinking water. She's being helped by Blue Planet Network member International Lifeline Fund. And Jessica over here, here in the state of California, right in the Central Valley. She's being helped by Blue Planet Network member Community Water Center. And just to make it totally full circle, Jessica is only a three and a half hour drive away from Mary and her friends and where they popped those champagne bottles that took 171 gallons of water a bottle to produce. So I want to leave all of us with a message that we all have to do everything in our power to help preserve the power and potential and the magic of clean water, the humankind wonder drug, for millennia to come. And I want to close with a thought and a saying from W.H. Auden, the poet, that was shared with me by Rudy Dundas, a very dear friend of mine and an amazing photographer who took many of the photographs you saw tonight. Thousands have lived without love not one without water. Thank you all.